I want to thank, thank Isimol for inviting me to this timely, important deliberation. I'm grateful to the organizers who have worked hard and thoughtfully in creating a great space for all of us to engage with many stimulating conversations, both in and outside of the formal conference sessions. I want you to know that I'm neither an expert on science, communications, climate change, or policy making. I'm based at the New School in New York City, a university well known for its critical social science research, and I have been working on several collaborative initiatives in India and China, including Himalayas, for many years. For this session on connecting the dots, translating science to policy through effective communication, we're really here to consider a problem. How to address the gap between science and the public, and between scientific knowledge and data that can inform and shape policy making. Here I want to suggest this may be a bit narrow of a question, and that we need to rethink and broaden the questions about science, policy, and the public. Let me give you two examples to suggest why we might need to reframe this question. First, there has been a lot of discussion about the current IPCC report, including focus on Himalaya. Anyone who is familiar with the previous IPCC reports, especially the summary reports, for policymakers would agree that these documents do a pretty good job of clearly and simply stating the science, the uncertainty, and the range of options on climate change. If this is true, then perhaps the problem is not that climate science is unclear or hard to understand, but it's something else. Especially when you consider that most key decision makers and leaders have access to qualified people who can help them understand the details of climate change research. So as people involved in improving how science is communicated to the public and policy makers, we first need to understand if the problem is how scientific knowledge and scientific findings are communicated. This brings me to my second example about reframing how we connect the dots. As I said before, I work in a university setting and have young kids of my own, which provide me opportunities for frequent interactions with young learners. A majority of these young people intuitively understand some of the basics of climate change. In fact, just last month, I participated in the largest climate change, climate march in history, and it was led by young people concerned about their future. If you listen to them closely on climate change, you will find second reframing of this question of science and policy making is really about power and politics. If we assume for a moment that science is or can be communicated to both the public and policy makers, then we must ask what other obstacles or dots are we missing when we talk about science communication. Even when there is broad public support for climate science, as there is in much of the world, translating this scientific knowledge into action is repeatedly blocked by deeply entrenched interests, especially those multinational corporations and politicians whose greed and power require that we keep burning fossil fuels, continue cutting down forests, continue to build more dams, and continue to private our, privatize our natural and cultural resources for sale in global markets. This is a different problem than communicating the science. Because of the increased number of climate-related crises, there is a growing media attention on climate change, but too often, these discussions happen after the fact 
and disappears just as quickly. However, through these events, I believe people know that the climate change is happening. Through these events, we know now that what we are talking about here is how to have policymakers and leaders pay closer attention to what science tells us and then make hard decisions on the use of resources such as oil, coal, water, and forests. The need is how to use communications, communication effectively to create sustained engagement and action, both from leaders and public. One more minute. It is here I would make my final point that we need to think beyond science and beyond the human nature nexus. This requires more creative ways to engage policymakers and the public. As we know, climate change also involves questions of ethics and values that go beyond science. This is where a deeper engagement with the arts and the humanities would not only add a new dimension to how we talk about climate change, but would also offer other ways to better understand and act on scientific knowledge. For example, this past Saturday, the India-China Institute, in partnership with the artist collective known as Lasna and the City Museum here in Kathmandu, hosted a roundtable discussion on climate change with nearly two dozen artists, writers, poets, and a 24-hour performance with internationally recognized uh, Nepali artist Ashmina Ranjit. You can see a photo from this performance. And I'm happy to ask Ashmina, who happens to be here, to please stand for her bold and inspiring performance and commitment to help us think and rethink why climate change matters. In a nutshell, what we really need to be thinking about is how to redraw our climate communication map. map maps that take these political, social, social and cultural obstacles into account. Thank you.